I love when Jesus was, you know, in Mark, in all three of the synoptic gospels, in fact, the story of the rich young ruler comes right after the story about Jesus blessing the children. And I think that, that there might be some significance to that. And Mark, who is briefer than the other writers, includes three details in his telling of the story that, uh, that, that the other two guys left out. And I, in case you're not familiar entirely with the story, it goes that Jesus was blessing the little kids. You know, I'm trying to think through this thing. I'm going, well, how do you bless children? Because I, I, I find them barely tolerable, less, let alone something that you'd want to bless. So I'm thinking, well, how have I, you know, I've got all these nieces and nephews and stuff. How have I blessed them? And I, the only, you know, the only thing I could think of is, is you know, you pick them up and you throw them as high in the air as you can. And <laughs> then you catch them right before you, they splat. <laughs> or you get down on all fours and, you know, they ride you and you try to buck them off and that kind of thing. So I'm trying to picture Jesus do this. And then the disciples, they come up and they see Jesus who, you know, they're good monotheists, so they're really, I'm sure, struggling with his claims to be equal to God. And they see him, you know, they're kind of going, well, you know, when you put on that really straight academic face of yours and, and charge us with a lot of information, we can, we can kind of buy it then, but, but here you're acting like an idiot. And it's hard enough to believe that smart people are, are, could be the son of God, let alone this this bumbling idiot that's rolling around in the dirt with the children. And Jesus says, hey, guys, knock it off. You, if you want to come into my kingdom, you'll have to come in like one of these. You'll have to come in like a child. You have to let me throw you up in the air and catch you right before you splat. You have to ride on my back and let me buck you off. We have to wrestle a little. We have to play a little. And there's this guy who's a great student and probably a politician, the rich young ruler. And he's standing by waiting for his big photo op because that's what politicians do. And he's doing what all students do during lectures. He's trying to think of some great stump the teacher question. Some question that would be so impressive to all of his peers that they would all go, man, you're so smart to have thought to have asked that. So Jesus just gets done saying, you have to be a little child or you can't come in my kingdom. And then this guy goes up and asks the stupidest and most repeated question in the history of Christianity. Good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And uh, Mark then says these three things that I find amazing. First of all, I find it amazing that uh, Jesus had just answered his question before he even asked it. And it wasn't about what you do. It was about what you are. Jesus had just said, if you want to come into my kingdom, be a child. And who doesn't find it easy to be a child? I mean, what else are we going to be? And this guy was so arrogant that he didn't listen to God when God spoke. But Mark tells us something about God in his telling of this story that I find amazing. He says that Jesus looked at the man which says this must be the beginning of the good news. That even though we're so arrogant that we don't even listen to God, God is so humble that he looks at us, that he takes note of us. He's not impressed by our questions and by our answers, but he's quite taken with us. And having looked at the man, Mark tells us that he loved him, which I find amazing. Because this guy was using Jesus as a photo op. And Jesus loved him. And after he had looked at him, after he had considered him, and after he had loved him, then Jesus told him what to do if there was such a thing. And the thing that I find wonderful about what Jesus told this guy was I have a feeling like his security was all wrapped up in his possessions. And so he told him to get rid of his possessions something he didn't tell Nicodemus to do. I have a feeling maybe Nicodemus was all wrapped up in his religious heritage and in his genes. And Jesus told him to forget it and be born again. Because maybe it's more important that we know Jesus than anything else in the world. And maybe all our questions, maybe all our answers don't amount to a hill of beans. But they're fun to ask. And it's always impressive to have an answer, even 
though they don't ever amount to much. Sometimes we think that Christianity will be communicated when we become really intelligent or really articulate. But Christianity is communicated the same way diseases are. It's communicated through touch, through breath, through life, not through information. And Christian vitality does not come from having a great head, but it comes from being connected to a great God who really is life.